All right, I am uh, doing a sermon that some of you may have heard of before. Uh, it's called Having an Unoffendable Heart. Uh, it probably relates to, uh, to some of those spaces, even as uh, Sam was sharing, the necessity to have a heart that doesn't get offended, uh, which was the heart of Jesus. But um, I thought I'd start with a story. Uh, there, was a, there was a couple of guys sitting on the front porch, uh, just, you know, sharing a beer together and uh, looking out over the, over the garden, over the street. Next minute, a car pulls up and uh, a guy hops out of the car, uh, comes over to the front, you know, picket fence, and he grabs onto the gate and he rips the gate off the hinges, opens up the car, puts the gate in, hops back in the car and drives away. So one of the friends says to his mate who owns the house, he's like, did you see what just happened there? He's like, yeah, crazy. He's like, well, why didn't you say something? So well, I didn't want him to take offence. Well done. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Uh, here we go. If you want to open your Bible to uh, Matthew chapter 24, and it says, so I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. I know you've all got one of those sitting around somewhere. It says, then they'll hand you over for persecution and they will kill you. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. This is Jesus speaking. It says, then many will take offense, betray one another and hate one another. So the reality is, from my perspective, offense is widespread in our society. And I think offense is or could be one of the most relationally destructive forces that exists. Offence can destroy families, relationships, it can destroy churches, it can even affect and impact entire nations. There's been nations that have been literally been torn apart because one group looked upon another group with offence and uh, sought to, to wipe them out in some way. I think it would be safe to say that more churches have been torn apart by offence than by persecution. Offence does more damage to the bride of Christ than people being murdered for their faith. The number of churches that split, I mean, the number of denominations that exist, thousands upon thousands of Christian denominations that exist today. And I imagine that some of those were started from a place of offence, a place of division and disagreement, but not one where there is a seeking to uh, work together and work it out and be in a spirit of unity as Jesus would have it, but it becomes divisive and breaks things apart. So the reality is our offendability impacts our relationship with God and with other people. So it's not just a person to person issue. And we do, we, we like to talk a lot about relational issues uh, when we speak here, um, because relationships are really what Christianity is all about. It is all about our relationship with Father God. It's all about our relationship with one another. It's about our relationship with ourselves, our relationship to creation, because God is in the process of reconciling all things to Himself. And that first step is we are reconciled to God. But in that ministry of reconciliation that we are a part of, we are also needing to be reconciled to ourselves in some ways. Like we get to learn ourselves and know ourselves and be transformed by God. But also God is reconciling our relationships to one another and He is reconciling our relationship to creation itself. So God is interested in interpersonal relationships. Offence with others can often reveal offence with God or a barrier that we might have with God. So if you've done any of the larger house training, you know that things like judgments and expectations and inner vows and unforgiveness are oftentimes uh, established between us and maybe our parents or different authority figures in our lives, but they relate to then how we connect with God. So oftentimes barriers that we might have in personal relationships become barriers that we have in our relationship with Father God. So as we deal with those things, it doesn't just reconcile us to people, it actually helps us to reconcile in a relational way with the Father. So we might be under the blood of Jesus, in Christ, under the finished work of Christ, all of that sort of stuff. We know positionally we have been reconciled to God, but we're also relationally being reconciled to Him, and that is the process. 
And again, God often chooses to use people to reveal himself to us and also just to expose us, to expose any sinfulness and brokenness in us. Has anyone, has God ever used a person to reveal you? Yeah. I find the littler they are, um, sometimes the more revealing they can be. Not necessarily in height, but in age and uh, you know what I'm saying. So oftentimes, again, offence can be seen as uh, like an automated and almost justifiable response to someone's behaviour. So we might feel like, well, this person did this thing, so naturally I would be offended by that. They were offensive, so of course I'm going to get offended by their behaviour. It's a justifiable response. The problem that I have with that view is that I think offence is actually a choice. It's a decision that we make. We might not be aware of it, but we can choose in any situation how we respond. That's what being responsible is all about. So if I'm a responsible person, it means I'm responsible. If I'm irresponsible, it means I'm, I'm not able to respond freely and rightly to a situation. But to be a responsible person means I'm able to respond, but able to respond rightly and righteously. So being offended is an internal response, usually to an external situation. It's something that happens at a heart level, at a deeper level sometimes than what we're conscious to, that actually springs up in that moment. And again, if we're not connected to our own hearts, if we're not willing to do that internal journey with God, then we can go around assuming that it's all got to do with the surface situation that's actually happening when really there's things that are going on underneath that for us. Some of you might remember my story of, um, of road, I, well, it wasn't road rage. I'll tell the story. There's new people here. It might benefit you or not, um, the story, oh, that's actually, it, was, it would be the anniversary yesterday of this event some many years ago. <laughs> we went to, uh, Lisa and I went to the Vos book sale, it's now Morling College, so they do a big, lots of secondhand books, and my wife loves books, loves old books. We literally had to do, we, we went around the books, so there's just thousands of books, all super cheap, people's books that they donate, and uh, we literally couldn't carry any more books, so we had to then go pay for those, go out to the car, drop them off, and then come back in for round two. And uh, she is, she's just frothing and uh, loving it, so it's good. But, um, but I was there m many years ago. Noah was with me, and I was in a rush to get home, but I pulled up to a set of traffic lights. There was construction on the left-hand side. And, uh, and in my, well, look, in anyone's estimation, there was, it was a green light to go left and red light to go forward. There was plenty of space, two cars ahead, for this car who was turning to go through, and the next car could have fit through the gap, and I could have gone through. So it's a car, you know, blocking the way, uh, not really. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, look, I'll just give them a friendly kind of, beep, beep, you know, just let them know, hey, I'm with you. I believe in you. I know you can make it through. I know you're scared, but together we can get through this, okay? So... That was, that was in my heart, I'm sure. So I beat my horn and where the construction's happening, there's a, there's a construction worker standing right at the front of my car and he turns to me and says, Oi, stop that. And he tells me off. And, uh, and so I kind of didn't really respond in the moment. I just, you know, did nothing, said nothing. Light to go forward goes green. Finally, now there was enough for two cars to fit through. So this car drove off, driving around the corner. So... As what happens sometimes, you have an interaction, you don't really respond in the time, but then you play back the scenario in your head and thinking how might you have dealt with it differently the next time, okay? So I'm now playing this scenario back in my head and I thought, oh, you know what I should have done? I should have just, just slammed my hand on the horn and he was standing right at the front of my car. So it would have been blasting in his ears and he would have this construction work guy would have been like, oh, you know, and, oh, and I catch myself doing, I'm like, what am I doing? Just being silly. What am I thinking about that sort of stuff for? It's not a big deal. Literally maybe 30 seconds later, then I'm thinking like, if I had like a baseball bat in the boot of my car and I could just get that out and like come out. So sorry, did you, you know, did you say something to me? Or, you know, and I'm like, what, what am I, what's going on here? And so I stopped myself from, from thinking these things. 
30 seconds later, I'm imagining, imagine if I had a gun and I'll just have it like tucked in the front. I just lift up my shirt and say, you say something. Did you, did you say something? Are you talking to me? You know, like, and I'm going, and, I'm, and again, I catch myself and I'm like, I've gone from being mildly impatient to a homicidal maniac in this fantasy that I'm playing out in my head. And really the scenario didn't justify it, but in my mind, there's this internal thing that's, oh, it's eating me up. And so I'm playing out this fantasy in my head as to how I can try and resolve this internal angst that I'm feeling. So I caught myself again and I was like, God, what is going on? What was happening in that scenario? And I felt like God saying to me, I said, that person embarrassed you. You felt embarrassed. So, okay, so I wasn't, I got offended, but really what was under that offence was this embarrassment. And it's like, yeah, and, this, and it made me insecure because the fact is he was right. I was being impatient and it was rude. It wasn't, it was gonna save maybe 30 seconds, which in the scheme of my life isn't a big deal. But he caught me out. I was being rude and this guy caught me out. He, he was right in what he said. I was being impatient. And yet it has this response and it embarrassed me. But the way that I dealt with my embarrassment and my insecurity was to then play out this aggressive kind of machismo, oh yeah, I'll show you type scenario. And I wonder again how often times that happens, you know, particularly kind of younger men, you know, like this fights happening all the time. It's all of that sort of thing. Someone says something and really it's, it's hitting an insecure place in a person's heart. It's hitting a wound somewhere, it's, it's doing something. And the response is, seemingly a justifiable response, is to be aggressive and to attack and start a fight and do all of that sort of stuff. But really what's that's what's happening at the surface level. Could be even someone calls you a name. Like people have died because they, said a word to someone and then you get all those one punch kind of attacks and things that happen like that. But it starts off someone just saying a word. Words don't have any, like there's nothing violent about words. How you respond to those words, it can feel like an attack upon you, but really they're literally just waves of air. That's what words are. What you're hearing now is a frequency of air movement coming through. And yet it can have this response because what's in me gets impacted by how those, that frequency of air movement is put together in a particular way. And if it finds a landing place in my heart, then I'll have a response. But the response might not be, someone calls you a name, oh, excuse me, I just wanna let you know, when you said that, it actually really hurt me and it really, it upset me, and I'm actually quite insecure about that, that part of me. Someone, you know, maybe made a comment about your height or your weight or your hair colour, whatever it is, you know, and it's like, and actually that, that hurt my heart, and I just need to let you know that, and, uh, and then the person would obviously fall down their knees and apologize, you know, they'd probably laugh at you if you did that, if they don't understand the heart. But you know what, so we don't have that, so we just respond aggressively, or respond by shutting down. We respond in some way that's not necessarily healthy and life-giving, um, but I've seen, I won't tell the story, but someone shared a great story with me the other day about in their family and where a family member was being super ag aggressive and challenging all of these things and saying, bringing out all these accusations and this person chose to enter in and say, hey, I'm really sorry that I did that and that it made you feel that way. When normally it'd be like, no, you did that and you, get, and you come back with the aggression, you're fighting back and forth, but they came in low and in humility and said, I'm really sorry and this person just broke down. I started crying and then their heart was able to flow out. So that's another story. You can ask me who it was and I'll tell you who it was <sighs> or not. Um, so again, in my experience of, of pastoring and shepherding people, I've, I've noticed that even some people don't see it as an issue. It's like, well, yeah, of course I got offended. They did something offensive, I got offended. It's not an issue. It's simply the natural consequence of what somebody else has done. It's not even my fault. I, it's their fault that I'm offended. It's what they did that offended me. The problem is all them and it's none of me. Okay? The blame gets put on others as to why we are offended. Others offend us. They are the ones causing the offence and we are simply the recipients of their offending words or actions or behaviours. I wanna to present to you that in the kingdom, offence is not okay. 
it doesn't produce any good fruit. It actually produces a whole lot of destructive fruit. But there's also the opportunity for us to live like Jesus did, live in a way where we can be unoffendable. Who likes the idea of being unoffendable? I do. Because when we get offended, we actually come under the control of another person. And that's slavery and bondage. And in no way, shape or form is God desiring that for our lives. Offence is an unhealthy and potentially sinful response in our heart to other people's behaviour. The way of Christ is to live as an unoffendable people. So obviously if we say, well, that's a kingdom way, how do we know that? And I'd say, well, I'd say Jesus had, I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, I'd say. <laughs> uh, fog on lake on here. The spirit of fog on lake on's come upon me. I'm anointed. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but uh, woo. <laughs> Jesus had an unoffendable heart. Let's just move on. This is point number one of um, seven points of a two-part sermon. Maybe three parts, depending on how, how well you guys go. Um, I'm cool to go all through both parts, but I, 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 I'm respecting you. I don't want you to be offended with me. So Luke 23, verse 34 speaks of Jesus on the cross. So this is Jesus, he has gone through uh, an, uh, a trial where he is accused of things that he didn't do. He has been beaten, you know, to the, to the verge of, of death. He's been humiliated, his beard has been torn out, crown of thorns placed upon his head. Horrific things, lashes on his back, forced to carry his own death device up the hill. Okay, now he's been nailed to a cross, and what does he say? He says, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Now, I think if anyone at any time in history would be justified at being offended at a particular scenario or at a particular people, it would be the perfect, righteous, holy, never sinned Jesus. And even at that moment, the most horrific, humiliating place to be in. And again, not, not pretty Jesus with a long This is Jesus naked, fully exposed, fully humiliated. Every part of who he was manifestly stripped away by the people around him. And his response is, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And again, oftentimes, and when we relate to people, and we can get offended with things, and it's actually not the intent of the other person even to do that, to cause us harm. We can get offended by how we perceive things. Jesus, in that moment, he kept silent. Because, and he didn't need to respond to their slander. He didn't need to say something back. You know, sometimes someone will say something, you feel that need, oh, I've got to say something, I've got to justify myself, I've got to stick up for myself, I have to say something back. Jesus kept silent. When there was lies coming at him, when there was slander coming at him, no, I am the king of the Jews. No, you don't understand, I am the king of the Jews. No, ha, ha, he's, oh, call yourself king of the Jews. Come down from the, I will come down from the cross. I'll show you all of the things that he could do to represent who he was, and yet he wasn't offended by their behaviour. He knew who he was, so he didn't need to stand up for himself in those moments. He was mocked and tortured and humiliated, but there was no sin in him to be aroused by other people's sinful behaviour. He wasn't able to be controlled by the people. He gave up his life, but he also didn't respond, have to respond. If anyone had the right to be offended, it was Jesus. Jesus. Not only was he not offended, but even in the middle of that scenario, he was free to bless those who were cursing him. And I feel like there's somewhere in the Bible, in the New Testament, words that came out of Jesus' mouth where he says, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Whereas sometimes we, we struggle to love our friends. <laughs> We struggle to love our spouses or our children, whatever it is, like there can be this struggle with love and yet Jesus, what He presents is such a radical way to live. 
He knows the power of love and He knows what it looks like to even in the worst of scenarios to respond in love. And that's the same response that He calls us as His people to live by. Even where there is a justifiable reason as to why you should respond to those things, you don't have to respond. You're not controlled by what other people do when we're following Jesus, being transformed by Him. Amen? All right. Matthew eleven six. Jesus replied to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, those with skin diseases are healed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And if anyone is not offended because of me, he is blessed. We do, I, I mean, I, just, I know people at times in their journey can be offended even with God. Now again, I'm not saying just, oh, you should just squash down your offence or just ignore your offence. I'm saying if it's a real response that you're having, like grab onto it, but deal with why am I offended in this scenario? Rather than dismissing, oh, I'm not, I'm not offended. It's like, oh, maybe I, I'm actually offended. So it means that behaviour, action, word, that God has done, maybe something God hasn't done, this, what someone has done, what a person hasn't done. But I've got to embrace this. I'm actually offended in this situation. That was me when I'm driving my car in this scenario. I, had, I, I thankfully had the insight to say, I'm going to actually grab what's going on here in my heart and wrestle it through and recognise, hey, wow, there was some things going on in my heart that I wasn't aware of. And if I kept playing out that scenario, eventually that internal angst would have lifted until the next time that a scenario like that happened. So a question might be, well, didn't Jesus get angry and offended even what was happening in the temple? I've had people talk to me and say, well, Jesus got angry. And I'm not saying Jesus didn't get angry. I'm just saying we don't have any scriptural evidence of him ever being angry. Now, Brad, in the temple, he, he made a whip. and So someone can read for me and tell me where it says that he was angry and offended. He said, as he entered the temple and he drove out all those who sold and bought in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons, he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you made it a den of robbers. So this is oftentimes people say, that's justifiable. See, Jesus got angry. He got offended at what they were doing. And all I'm saying is it just doesn't say that in the text. So you're welcome to take that perspective, but we can't justify that scripturally, that Jesus ever was angry, ever was offended at anything. Is that okay? And I don't know of any other scriptures where it, where it says that he was. So Jesus could have done that again. Not, he's like, oh, I've seen this, how dare they? And it gets all angry and, and does all of those things. Or he's just like, I'm gonna, I need to show these people that what they're doing is not okay. So I'm actually gonna walk out a righteous act here and do what the Father is doing and drive this out. But he's not, it doesn't mean that he's fired up and he's yelling at people and spitting on people and doing any of those things. He's just letting them know, this is what righteousness looks like. You're behaving unrighteously and I'm gonna show you physically, what the Father's desire is. So again, in any relationship, whether it's our relationship with God, our relationship with others, we need to take responsibility for our sinful responses to other people's behaviour. So we are never justified in sinning back against someone, even if they've sinned against us first. That's really hard to... No, sometimes, <laughs> but we're never justified to sin. God never gives us permission, okay, you can go and sin now. I know they did something simply, so you, you can go and sin against them. If God says, you're welcome to bless them. I give you freedom to forgive them. I give you freedom to, to pray for them but I never give you freedom to sin against them. Oh, it burns. But I want it so badly. And it's like, I oh, know this because we're not fully formed into the likeness of Jesus yet, but he's working on it. Matthew 7, 
1 to 5. It says, Do not judge so that you won't be judged. For with the judgment you use, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but don't notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and look, there's a log in your eye. Hypocrite. First take the log out of your eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So sometimes in relationships, we can see things in other people that can cause offence in our hearts. But when we get offended, We lose the capacity, we lose the ability to rightly, lovingly and truthfully speak to the other person about the issue that we see. We become blinded by our offence. The big log in the eye blinds us. And we forget about the fact that we have a log in our own heart. And that could be in our offence can be the thing that's in us. But if you get the speck of dust If you get a speck of dust in your eye, even irritating and painful as it can be, you can usually still see properly. But if someone were to shove, if you imagine someone to shove a giant log in your eye, I've never had a a log, not even a giant stick in my eye. I got hit in the eye once with a a, a little pebble and that really hurt. Um, But that's that's the worst I've had. Uh, But you imagine it kind of, it would probably disable your ability to see clearly. But this is the problem then. We see something in someone else. The reality is that same thing is possibly in us. And yet when we see it in them, it it grates us. And sometimes that's actually God saying, hey, I wanna show you what you're like by showing you what it's like in somebody else. Oh, you're so wise, God. Uh, I can't get away from myself. Um, I'll just, I've I've removed all the mirrors in my house. I don't have to look at myself, but then I see it in somebody else. We become blinded to our own issues. And then this can become our motivation even to speak to the other person about what we see in them. We might see someone acting pridefully and it offends us because of the pride in our own hearts. I just wanna encourage you, anytime you see something in somebody else, first step is to say, God, is that in me? Is that really irritate me about that person because it's actually in my heart too? And I've, I've just found that a lot of times that's the case. Doesn't mean it's not in their heart, no. Does it remove the responsibility of that person to deal with their heart? Not at all. But if I'm not being responsible for my own heart, how can I expect somebody else to be responsible for theirs? So it's like, wow, I'm offended because that person is so proud and boastful and all these things. Lord, is that in my heart? I'm like, and then it's like, yes, it's in my heart. Okay, Lord, come and deal with me. Deal with whatever's causing me to behave that way. So then I can, and when I'm free from that, then I can go to that person and pull them aside and have a loving, life-giving conversation and say, I've just noticed this about you and I've actually recognised it was in my heart and the Lord has been so gracious to reveal it to me and I'm just wondering, I'm just putting it before you because it, it might be in your heart too and release them. Rather than talking behind their back, tearing them down to other people, gossip, slander, bitterness. Well, I'm not gonna hang around them anymore. I'm gonna remove all of those sorts of things that we do to avoid what is actually being revealed about our own hearts. So we can feel compelled to speak to the person about their issue, but only because the offence in our hearts is compelling us. There's a sense of injustice that their behaviour is wrong and causing us discomfort because of the defense, the offence in our heart. If our hearts were unoffendable, then their actions wouldn't cause us to react in the same way. We would be able to see the issue clearly and speak truth and life into the situation without our words and motivations being tainted by the unrighteousness in our own hearts. So I see something and it has this huge response in me I'm being offended but, and it's impacting something in me rather than discerning and saying, oh, I, just, I noticed that about that person. And when you don't have offence in your heart about those things, then you oftentimes will have compassion. That's what Jesus had when he's hanging on the cross. He looks at them, it's like, these, they, have, they have no idea what they're doing. They think they're doing the right thing. You imagine there would have been people in the crowd that have said, this guy here, what a jerk, this Jesus guy, saying that he's king of the Jews. He's not king of the Jews. I know who the Messiah, the Bible's told me he's gonna be like this and we're looking for this Messiah. This guy needs to die because that's what you would do with people who 
were behaving in those ways. There would have been people filled, filling that crowd who were thinking righteously in their minds, yes, that, that guy needs to die. But it doesn't mean that they were right. They just thought they were right. And how many of the people around Jesus were offended, the religious leaders that were offended by the things that Jesus said? How can you claim those things? How can you say those things? And offense is what drove them to crucify Jesus. All right. Point number two. Offence disables our ability to speak the truth in love. So bottom one, we know that Jesus had an unoffendable heart. Point number two is that offence disables our ability to speak the truth in love. God places us in community in order to stir up the broken and unrighteous areas of our lives and the insecurities in our hearts in order to bring healing, freedom and restoration to our lives and relationships. So relationships can be hard because that's the pathway of healing and restoration for us. The word offence in the Greek is the word scandalizo. Scandalizo. That's where we get the word scandal from. But I mean, literally how many scandals in history have happened because of offence? I mean, I don't, I don't pay too much attention to American politics, but... You, you watch that stuff go on, how much offence is there to the point where one leader can't say anything right and one leader can't say anything wrong. Rather than saying, yeah, there's some stuff that I don't agree with, but that point you made, that's right. And you know, there's some stuff that I agree with, but that point there's actually wrong. But you pick a side and you rally against the, the other one and you'll find it's like nothing can be true from that other person. That's what offence does. It blinds us from being able to see the truth and speak the truth. So when we have offence in our hearts, we can't lovingly and righteously share truth with other people because our truth is tainted with our own brokenness. Amen? All right. I've lost my place on the screens, that's all right. So another part about offence is offence is always subjective. Offensive behaviour is always subjective. This is the reality. What is offensive to one person is not to another person. You could watch a, a comedian. A joke would be offensive to one person, hilarious to another person. There could be things that I would say today. One person gets offended, another person's like, well, I didn't didn't bother me at all. So the issue is, if we say, hey, that's offensive, that's according to my opinion and my perspective. So I can't even base whether or not it is right or wrong based upon how offended I am because of it. Because you can be super offended about something, doesn't mean it's necessarily offensive. It's just offensive to you because of how it impacts you. Now, again, I'm not saying there are things that people do that would, their intent is to be offensive. Or we might even, in relationship to Scripture, relationship to the heart of God, the way of Jesus, we might say that's actually offensive behaviour. That's an offensive perspective that they have. Doesn't mean I have to be offended. I can look at that and say, from the truth of the Scriptures, from the truth of what I know of God's heart, that's wrong and that's offensive. But I choose not to be offended because I wanna rightly judge things. I wanna rightly discern things. I wanna be free from that, that I don't have to be bound by that. And I can actually let it go past me if the Lord's not causing me to do something or I can engage with it if the Lord is calling me to engage with it. When we remove our offendability, we're unable to view things from a more objective position. So we can look at things and we can clearly discern what is going on more clearly because we're not in the mix of everything that's going on. So the question is, is being offended a sin? Here we go. So being offended is not listed, as far as I can see in the Scriptures, as a specific sin, like a bunch of sins aren't. There are a bunch of things that we would consider in the kingdom to say, yeah, that's sin, but it's not listed there. 
okay? Or it's, it's, it's just there's nothing fruitful about it or it leads to bondage, it leads to captivity, it leads to all of these things, but there's not this long list. God didn't write out a long list of all of the sins that could ever possibly happen because someone somewhere would find one that's not on the list and be like, yeah, let's go. Um, so you need to you know, group things together, understand the heart of, of God's intentions in this. So it's not, but... Offence can be a doorway to a multitude of other sins depending on how we respond. So we can respond sinfully to something or we can respond righteously. If something offensive happens, I get offended and I respond unrighteously, then I've sinned against the sin. So I've actually achieved nothing. I've actually been drawn in and, and unrighteousness has come out. So righteousness hasn't been revealed my offendable heart has been revealed. Offence can be like a, a warning light flashing that points to a deeper issue in our hearts. So it can actually reveal sin in us. And that can be the worst. Oh man, when someone's being really offensive and you're like, oh, and it's grating you and you get so offended and then God's like, it's you. And you're like, no, why? <laughs> I spent all of that time justifying my behaviour and all that time talking to my friends about how bad this person is and, and oh, it's me, no. And look, if you've been on the, on, the, on the heart journey, on the sanctification journey, I'm sure you've come across that many times. Uh, I've said before, I've asked God two times to humble me because I didn't learn the first time. I find it's a prayer that he answers. You want, God, you want to see God answer your prayer? Ask him to humble you. As I said before, there's a reason why the scriptures say humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God. Because God's like, I think you're way better to do it yourself. Because <laughs> if I have to do it, it's like with my kids. I say, clean up your room. Put all your toys away. And so like, you can do it yourself or I can do it. But if I do it, there's gonna be a few less things in your room after I'm done. The bin's gonna be full and your room's gonna be empty, but ever, I'll be happy. So I'm like, how about you clean it up yourselves and then it'll be, it'll be much better off for you, okay? I think it's in the same way when God says, humble yourselves, because when I humble you, it's gonna, I'm gonna do it really well. God, I'm gonna do a really good job. It's gonna be spick and span, but you're gonna, you're gonna be, yeah, you're gonna feel the impact of it. Um, so again, offence can be, when we, when we get offended, it's like, beep, 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 I need to take, stock of what's going on in my heart. I need to come before the Lord. Lord, show me any wicked way in my heart so that I can be free and clean and whole. And the third point is that pride is usually the seed bent, seedbed for offence. It is often our pride that suffers offence most easily. Pride leads us to expect more than what we deserve. Pride is a form of self-worship God must destroy our pride or He desires to and to do so, He will allow offences to rise up in our hearts and expose what we lack in humility. It is not wrong to expect encouragement for our good works, but we cannot be offended when it doesn't happen in the timing that we're expecting. Again, people can get offended because I didn't get enough praise, I didn't get enough adoration for what I did, which is then the reveal is that the only reason I did it is for the praise and adoration that I'd receive from it. But I don't, I don't look at that because I get offended about they didn't, that person got called out and, and told nice things, but they didn't talk about what I've done. And I'm offended now. I'm going, well, but what, is that why I was doing it? Was I doing it to get the present? Well, then that's a sinful thing in my heart. Now I'm finding, I'm finding my identity or whatever it is in the words of other people. Is affirmation good? Absolutely. Does God want us to encourage and bless and affirm another? Absolutely. But if I'm living by the words of other people and I'm getting offended when I don't receive them, there's something wrong in my heart. And that is the way that offence happens. Someone does something we don't like and that action or those words find a wound in our heart and they provoke it. And this can be if we have judgments against certain people, we have expectancies about how life's gonna come out, inner vows, all that sort of stuff that we learn in prayer ministry training. So we are unaware of the wound, but we experience the pain. 
And instead of recognising our own pain and seeking healing, we look for someone to blame for causing the pain. We become offended at the other person and if the offence isn't dealt with, it opens the door to sin in our heart and our behaviour depending on how we respond. Have you ever been through that pathway before? Yeah. So oftentimes there's like trigger points for offence. There's things that might trigger us off to get offended. It can be someone's behaviour towards us or it can be our interpretation of someone's words or behaviour towards us. Man, I've had people offended at me or offended at the church or offended at another leader or person and they talk out the story of what this person did or what they said and you're like, no, that's not what happened. No, that's not what they said. Not at all. Like not even like you just totally misheard what they said. Or it can be, uh, yeah, when you said that, this is what you meant. And you're like, no, I didn't mean that at all. I'm really sorry that you heard it that way. It certainly wasn't in my heart and I don't remember the words that I'm saying. So I can take responsibility if I say something that offends you. I can take responsibility because my desire wasn't to hurt you but I can't take responsibility on your behalf for how you got offended. But perception is reality for an offendable heart. Maybe we get offended if someone says something we don't agree with or don't wanna hear, but ultimately all offence is rooted in our own hearts and it's simply drawn out by the behaviour of others. I use the analogy, it's like if I came up and I gave you a hug and the next minute you feel this pain, you call me like, ah, what'd you do that for? Would you do that? And you're like, oh, I just gave you, no, oh, the pain you've caused. Now this person's got a, a, a broken collarbone. You didn't know that, they didn't know that. All of a sudden you give them a hug and then it's like, you're the one who's caused me pain. No, I was just doing a loving act of kindness and, and, and embracing you. You're the one that has the broken bone that got revealed and exposed in that interaction. It would be like if you went to a doctor's surgery and, and you're sitting down, you do the consultation and the doctor says, look, we've done some tests and uh, I, just, I need to let you know you've, you've got diabetes. <gasps> how dare you give me diabetes? <laughs> what are you talking, how, how did this even happen? It was when you stuck the needle in, you put diabetes into me, didn't you doctor? How dare you? I was like, no, 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 I'm just, I'm giving you a diagnosis of what's already in you. I didn't give you diabetes. No, how dare you? And storming out the docs, doctors gave me diabetes. Tell all your friends. Don't go that, doctor. I know you wouldn't do that, but you would get offended when someone else says something that stirs up pain that's already in you. Yeah? All right. We are, we are coming to the end of our time. So I want to stop there. Otherwise, I'll, I've probably already bombarded you with a whole lot of stuff about offence. But what I would love to do, we'll hold it there, we'll continue next week, but I would love to pray. If you're wanting to, and I give you full permission to not, um, if you're wanting to invite the Lord to reveal any offendability in your heart. Okay, I wanna pray for those who wanna do that. I'm gonna ask everyone to stand up, but you can decide in your own heart if you wanna agree with my prayer. I'm not gonna get leave people sitting down or whatever because then it might be awkward. No, you don't want to pray. <laughs> or you can sit down as well. Stand or sit if you can't stand. Um, Andy's st sitting, see? He's clearly, telling me, whatever Andy, do you want to pray? No, no. <laughs> I just know for me, this is such a significant uh, topic. I've preached this word several times here and in other churches around the place, but I just know that the the Lord so desires to free us from the impact of our own offendability, but also to create sustainability in our relationships within the church, to remove that, um, that point that can cause massive division. Like literally churches have been torn apart because one person's offence about something, something that was done, something that wasn't done, I mean, even in the church, people will leave the church. Oh, I didn't, the music was too loud or they didn't play these songs. They sang too long. They didn't do this. They did do this. They used this. They preached from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. How could they? But like little things like that can cause massive impact. I'm like, I wanna, I wanna live free from that. And I believe that God wants His church to live free from that so that we're not bound under this thing of offence and Jesus can free us. 
I interact with people, I'm like, man, I know that person is way less offendable. I'm not saying anyone's completely unoffendable. But, but I see people and I was like, man, this, and there's just a freedom upon their life. They don't get tossed to and fro by other people's words or perspectives or um, even negative interactions and conflict. They're not shaken by that. And they don't go around trying to slander and tear other people down. They seek to bless, they seek to honour, they seek to love. And that is the way of Jesus. But it is a radical way. I want you to know that if you choose the unoffendable way, you will encounter situations that will feel so unjust that you keep your mouth shut. So unjust that you don't gossip behind someone's back. It'll feel so unjust and un... It'll just feel really hard. (laughs) But it is the way of Christ and it is the way of life. It is the way of blessing. It is the way of transformation for you, but for the other person as well. I know it's a radical way, but like most of the ways of Jesus, it's the only way that's gonna bring life and transformation to this nation even. Even as we're praying and interceding into reconciliation, how much of that is generational offence? Now I'm not saying that any unrighteous acts were justified, but to, to live in generations of offence does not bring righteousness to a situation. It doesn't bring freedom. We need to honour the impact. So again, I'm not saying to you, I'll just be a doormat, let people walk all over you. Not at all. Stand up for yourselves, speak truth, but do it from a place of freedom. Do it from a place of life. Do it as as a righteous response to unrighteous behaviour. But if the church can't respond righteously, then we are disempowered. We need to stand up for what is righteous for the, for the ways of the Kingdom, but to do it in a way that actually reflects righteousness. Not with banners depicting words of hate, <laughs> but living lives that actually demonstrate this is how Jesus lived. And it was radical and transformative. It transformed the Roman Empire and it's been transforming generations ever since then. But when we step into a place where we start to fight back against other people's unrighteousness, rather than follow the way of Jesus, it doesn't produce the fruit of the Kingdom. Why don't you pray with me if you desire to. But Father, we just, uh, we want all that You have for us, Lord, and we wanna be freed from all that You don't have for us, Lord. We don't wanna be held captive by anything, Jesus. We wanna live in freedom and life. We wanna live free, from offence, God. We wanna be able to speak the truth in love because we are able to walk in righteousness and wholeness and freedom, Lord. We want to have a clarity of discernment, Father, so we can rightly see what You're doing. We can rightly see where people need help, Lord, where they need freedom in their own lives. So we invite You, Holy Spirit, all those hearts that are saying yes, maybe boldly or tentatively, we say, Holy Spirit, would You come and even throughout this week, would You be prompting me to reveal any areas in my heart where there is offence, Lord? In any ways that I'm living in an offendable way. Father, where I'm holding on to things, where I'm not willing to forgive, where I'm not willing to bless, where I'm not willing to pour back in, where I'm not willing to love, Would You reveal if any of the disablement in me is because of offence in my own heart? And Lord, if that is the case, would You take us on a journey to free us from that, Lord? You said, Jesus, it's for freedom that You came. It's for freedom that You set us free, Lord. Not that we might one day experience it, but that we might today live in the freedom that You purchased on the cross. And Jesus, we love Your ways. Your ways are perfect, Jesus. Your ways are perfect, Lord. And the way that You've called us to live is a perfect way, Jesus. So would You help us by the power of Your Holy Spirit to walk in Your ways? Would You give us ears to hear Your voice when You're calling us to walk in Your ways? And would we live under that fountain, fully immersed in Your grace, Your power, Your presence, 
to live out Your ways, Jesus. And when we, when we are confronted with unrighteousness, Lord, that we can respond in righteousness and life and love and Your Kingdom can come and Your will can be done. We love You, Jesus. We trust You on this journey. But would You give us ears to hear and eyes to see what You are doing in us, Lord? And would we be a people that take responsibility for our own hearts, Lord? Not living in blame, but choosing the way of freedom. We love You, we bless You, Lord. Amen. Amen. Bless You, family.